Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 21st, 2024. Our thematic first reading is Jeremiah 23, 1 through 6. Our semi-continuous first reading is 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 14a. Psalm 23, you might know it. The second reading is Ephesians 2, 11 through 12, and the gospel reading from Mark chapter 6, 30 through 34, and then jumping ahead to 53 through 56. This is your last reading from the Gospel of Mark for a while. We're going to take a five-week break after this and read from John, kind of picking up within Mark's narrative. I mean, you know, it fits, even though they're different Gospels. And then we will come back to Mark for the first Sunday in September. So be aware. But this is a good one. This is a good reading here. It, you might feel shortchanged because the feeding of the 5,000 is skipped over in Mark, but you'll get that next week. But instead, you get to talk about things like disciples and shepherds and mostly about healing people. Yes, although I would I would include the feeding of the 5,000, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because I would not. I think I'm not. going to agree with you, Caroline, but I'm going to wait and see if you're thinking what I'm thinking. No, I well, I think I think you're right, Matt. I mean that you know to what extent you there is so much to preach here uh, without it. I I I really I really think that's true. Uh, at the same time, another option, another direction could be to add it, and uh, and then the way uh, for for two reasons, how then it contrasts to. The feeding of the five thousand and John. Not that I want your whole sermon to be about compare and contrast Mark and John, uh, but it then does uh, lift up different uh, themes of what the feeding of the five thousand, how how it can be interpreted uh, interpreted and what it means, uh, particularly since it's the, uh, as we know, the only miracle that appears in all four of the Gospels. Uh, but then the other reason is this. He had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he, he began to teach them many things. And that compassion for them, as you talked about in your commentary, yet another excellent commentary by Matt Skinner. Thank you very, very much. Uh, and But I see that compassion he had compassion for them as sheep without a shepherd to connect the feeding of the 5,000 to that, that becomes an act of compassion mm -hmm. is one direction I would go mm -hmm. potentially homiletically. So that compassion then gets played out. Jesus compassion, that splognizomai, you know, literally gut wrenching <laughs> sense of what they need. The response of Jesus then is to feed them. Mm -hmm. And to to feed the people like mm -hmm. a shepherd would uh, his sheep, and and then of course we'll get the uh, we'll get the thematic connection to Jeremiah, and then Psalm twenty three of what it means to think of of Jesus and, and or God as shepherd. But one of one of those is uh, is nurturing and pasture and and provision and feeding. So those are my two reasons. Um, I I like that um, a slightly different way, but very much in line with where where you were, which is why I, I said I think I, I think we might be thinking the same thing. Uh, it was centering in on the acts of compassion, um, but I was not uh, looking to compare it to the the John version. I was simply looking at what compassion looks like, and so um, it actually is feeding the hungry, but it is also providing health care. It is being attentive to those who live in small towns, in big cities, in rural areas. Um, it is recognizing that everyone needs the opportunity to touch Jesus 
and and so in that same way that the the story of the healing of Jairus's daughter and the the woman were two different people uh, experiencing this healing of Jesus uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. Now we have um, all of these different people experiencing the compassion of Jesus, and it's set up. It's understood in the role that they understand as shepherds, but it's listed out in the ways that we can practice that today, whether we are urban or suburban or rural. All good. But do you think, yeah, Matt? You, you, it's I would because just he's already the... said something, he won't speak. <laughs> well, I wrote the commentary. So, I mean, I've, I've had my thousand words, but I mean, I think the... Um, yeah, you can you can you can include the feeding if you want, but you're going to do it next week. So I figure why why make people sit through it twice? Um, and I don't want to lose the way in which these two summary, or these you know kind of two small uh, readings put together here, really do underscore the kind of urgency mm-hmm. with which people pursue Jesus. Mm-hmm. He's not just popular. Mm-hmm. He's literally being pursued. I mean, he's mm-hmm. being sworn wherever he goes, mm-hmm. and people are doing things that are dramatic, right? He, they had no leisure even to eat. Um, they went to a, a place on their own. People hurried on foot and arrived there before them. Um, you know, and then in the in the second one as well, people recognize him at once. I mean, you get a sense of this almost frenzy around him. That's a different pacing than the feeding scenes where everybody's sitting down, presumably kind of, kind of imagine it's quiet. Everybody's watching him doing whatever he does with the fish and the loaf. So I don't know. I just, I, Mm. I like the freneticism of these. And you'll get some of that in John too. Uh, John also uh, next week, um, people are going to try to make him King. They're also going to see that he's gone and rushed to where, he is, you know, and pursue him again. But I, I, I want to make sure people get a sense. I want to make sure my congregation would get a sense for the sheer like magnitude of human desperation mm-hmm. that's attracted to him. And it's not like he's uninterested in healing people, but even if he healed everybody all the time and came back every week to get people who had gotten sick again, like it somehow isn't enough as well. Do you know what I mean? That this to kind of feel that load, I think is part of what Mark's getting at. And again, none of these can or can't be done depending upon whether you include the feeding or not. But I think yeah. we're talking about kind of ways into a sermon around this this aspect of Jesus's ministry. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. I'm trying to make sure we're all friends still, even though we disagree about which verses to add. I, I think we're- This is still our last on. podcast ever, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> listeners, dear listeners. When we well, come back, I think we'll we have different people. It's the bread of life that did it in that just what destroyed Sermon Brainwave. It was the bread of bread life, of, life. of course. <laughs> well, all all good, all good reasons to include or not not include. And I I think another reason I would include it is, uh, and again, it depends on you know and what direction you want to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think uh, one of the um, one of the things about what you you know what you were uh, what you were talking about Matt is that that reference in verse 56 then begged him that they might even touch the fringe of his clo- cloak and all who touched him you know back to the hemorrhaging woman and the power of touch i think is i think uh just that the reason for it, connecting with her desperation and her mm-hmm. urgency to mm-hmm. meet up with Jesus and knowing Knowing his power and what he can do, I think, is a really uh, could be a really homiletically powerful direction. Um, I think another another way I could possibly go is to zero in on the language of deserted place, uh, which you get in verse thirty one, verse thirty two, and then you do get in verse thirty five again. So uh, when it grew late, his disciples came and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now very late, which I think even adds to that desperation. Mm-hmm. You know, it's they're in a deserted place, which recalls, of course, the wilderness of Jesus' own temptation in the wilderness uh, back in Mark 1. 
and where uh, where he was waited on or served right by the angels of God. And here you have Jesus kind of uh, doing the service here. Mm -hmm. I know as he was served in the desert, so now he also. Uh, serves others in uh, in this deserted place, and so whether that's bringing that that location into the desperation, I think could work, or to imagine that part of what it means to for Jesus to be uh, the good shepherd, uh, in <clears throat> you know, the shepherd here is even in the in those even when in those deserted or wilderness places the shepherd will feed you the shepherd will take care of you and so somehow to somehow to uh draw out that or mm -hmm. unpack a little bit more that setting i think could be also mm -hmm. add to any one of these topics that we're mm -hmm. we're talking about it's worth telling people too anybody who's ever anybody who's ever been to galilee knows you can't keep like stuff like this secret um yes. <laughs> Uh, unless it's really foggy or something, but I mean, it's, um, if you're on a hilly place, you can see a crowd of 50 people who might be going from one place to the next, or these yeah. villages are not very large. And if large numbers are leaving or passing through them, it's disruptive. There's something very public about what's going on here that's balanced or, or that provides a kind of counterbalance to the secrecy that Jesus talks about. Mm -hmm. And the ways in which he avoids large population centers. It's interesting. So just to kind of help people get a sense for the the, the sounds and the smells and the sights of what this is, is looking like, I think is also really important. This doesn't take place in a kind of cultural or geographic vacuum, I guess is my point. And given the reference to uh, Shepherd here, this is why we have Jeremiah and Psalm 23, both of which you could bring in as background imagery to this. Uh, you could preach either on their own as well. Uh, you could l use Psalm 23 liturgically, uh, but it but it is worth thinking about, uh, particularly when we had Good Shepherd Sunday, the fourth Sunday of Easter. And now here we are, you know, in July, is there, is there something else about Jesus as shepherd that we're, you're now hearing differently mm. in the season of Pentecost or because of putting these passages together and not John 10? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, it's such a ubiquitous, well-known image of Jesus and yet I think often falls back on cliches <laughs> about, uh, about you know how dumb the sheep are and whatever and uh, and yet and yet the connections to you know Jeremiah uh, in John ten uh, you know to what extent there's drawn I mean Ezekiel thirty four and uh, and then you know and then Psalm twenty three so those would be some potential directions in in bringing in um, Jeremiah and the Psalm. Uh, particularly um, to get, a, get away from those um, uh, familiar tropes, uh, how desperate is the sheep? In it, definitely the kind of animal that needs a shepherd, um, and so that that plays into that idea of desperation, not in the sense of uh, neediness, but in the sense of this is the balance of the way things are. And so this responsibility, this task, truly is the work that needs to be done. It's not, uh, uh, what, what's the word that I want to say? It's not, um, uh, it, 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 like you said, it's not because they're um, bad or broken. It's because this is the responsibility that, 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 that uh, the shepherd has uh, for the balance of, of the world. What you could do is if, if last week, you took heat from people in your congregation saying you were being too political by preaching on the death of John the Baptist at the hand of Herod and, and Herodias. You could say, well, that was the lectionary, sorry. You could just preach then on Jeremiah 23 this week and talk again about, you know, power and unchecked mm -hmm. power and <laughs> the accountability of shepherds. And then when they're mad again, you can say it was that lectionary. I tell you, I just keep putting these passages up there uh, or Psalm 23 as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, remember when Jesus sees the people like sheep without a shepherd, that coming on the heels of 
the local shepherd, right? Mm-hmm. The local mm-hmm. tetrarch of the region who's too busy throwing parties mm-hmm. um, to uh, and and look like an idiot to um, make sure people are being fed. I mean, that's mm-hmm. right. It's huge. It's part of the story. They don't kill him at the end for no good reason. No, you know what I mean. It's uh, <laughs> he's, he makes certain people upset for particular reasons. So you can um, you can emphasize that. And well, then tell them to hang around next week. Go talk about bread. That's right. Yeah. But I, I think that's an important contrast, uh, Matt, is uh, the, again, recognizing the narrative context of of the feeding of the 5,000 and Mark, that, that, that Jesus is feeding these masses and, you know, Herod's having this private banquet um, yeah. and, you know, party <laughs> and... Uh, and who is who? Who are the people being fed? But just those who prop yeah. them up, and um, and so yeah, that's that. That's not a that's not a literary accident. I don't think on the part of right. <laughs> well, even to anticipate John, the people aren't going to ask him to become director of health and human services or to open a restaurant. They're going to want to make him king. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Because of what he's done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do we need to say more about Psalm twenty three, or can we move on to Second Samuel seven? I will I say I, 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 I will Go say ahead. I appreciated uh, the uh, commentary, and I particularly appreciated the the ending of it that notes on the presence of God. What does it mean to be in the presence of God? Which goes along with um, what I was saying uh, before in terms of the sheep need the presence of a shepherd. Um, but also um, what you were saying, Matt, earlier in terms of the desperation uh, of of these acts. If we if we just look at the the breakup of the gospel, the way that it's written, um, it's a, it's another way of looking at the words of the psalm that are not particularly paying attention merely to the metaphor of of of, of shepherding, but actually uh, the promise of the presence of God. Okay. All right. Second Samuel seven. David's a little bored. He's pretty much beaten everybody. <laughs> Lord had given him rest from all of his enemies around him, and now it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody knows there's a play on words here in terms of the word bait for house. People mm-hmm. should know that if you don't know that. Yeah. yeah. We got mm-hmm. commentaries. David wants to build a house for God. Wants to build a temple, and God says, "I'm going to build a house, a lineage, a dynasty." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for you. Mm-hmm. So people love learning Hebrew words, especially ones that are easy to pronounce like <laughs> bait. Good point. I appreciated the the commentary very much, very much. on this, uh, particularly uh, as the, when the uh, commentator moved toward um like the one line, David, like most faith leaders, wants stability yet needed to accept God's dwelling in the tent. Uh, and and then also uh, that the church is neither static nor stagnant, but mm-hmm. but is consistently f- finds itself underway. And so uh, even if you don't preach on this, I think that there might be some reassurance for pastors, some pastoral reassurance that, and in thinking about uh, what do we mean by our churches and the, and, and that desire to, we talked about this last week, but, but the desire to, uh, to keep God close or to contain God in some kind of way and how, but how do we do that? And yet, and yet uh, God, God, dwells in the tent or the church is always moving or in going in different directions and is not static. So that would be, I mean, it could be something that you reflect on, but I think it could also be a direction for a sermon, uh, especially as, especially as there is a continued um, anxiety around uh, around people not coming back to church. Uh, what is the future of the church? Uh, the future of of the buildings of the church. What do, what are those buildings for? What will they be used for once they're closed? How are we good? How are we good stewards of our church buildings, whether we remain in them or not? What parts of our buildings will we will we uh, will we um, 
commit to our ministry and our vision. So it, I think it raises a lot of questions around around some really real issues that uh, congregations are talking about right now. Mm-hmm. I really appreciate that listing, Caroline. Um, and partly, um, this is a comment that Matt made when we were talking about, uh, I, I believe it was when we were talking about the gospel reading. Uh, and uh, you were saying that all the healings that are done, all the work that is done is never complete. And um, it, it's why I appreciate the listing that you just did, Caroline. If for whatever reason, there was, a, 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 as a preacher, you were grateful for this text to talk about the temple, the sanctuary, the church, the building, the property. Um, those ministries, whether this is work that is complete, uh, a building paid off, um, a, um, a building acquired, uh, a new ministry um, a, a, a location established, um, a addition or something like that, um, to keep that also in mind when we think of even when it is done, it's not complete. Uh, and and so it's it's not just that the church is ever changing, uh, as the commentary uh, uh, commentator actually says uh, the line you quoted, Caroline, in terms of being uh, never being stagnant, um, but it's also a recognition that this space, um, even when it's successful, is not the end all and be all, and that the work that we have to do is the work that is evident outside of that space that would be a confining of the presence of God, because what God actually wants to do is to expand the people with whom God's spirit evidently abides. I think you could also, kind of talking about what both you were talking about in terms of making this contemporary and talking about space, I mean, I think there's, also it's also an important passage to talk about memory and mm-hmm. sort of remind people that this narrative comes from a time when apparently when the nation is trying to make sense of what's happened and, and all of the suffering and all of the humiliation that it's experienced and looks back to David as this key figure, again, unable to erase all of the, you know, less than pleasant things about David. And so you've got this, this pledge for Davidic dynasty that on the one hand is simply about, we're going to, Put all of our chips on David, right? And so this this kind of becomes a way of ensuring that the monarchy will always be Davidic in some way and will always be judged by David as its kind of measuring stick, which is deeply problematic in so many ways. Yes. But at the same time, also shows that's the way we do that, right? And we we hold on to memory. And of course, Christians have looked back on this, and even Jews before this was not originally a, a, a messianic text. Mm-hmm. But becomes a messianic text uh, over time amongst those who become followers of Jesus Christ, but even before then amongst some other Jews from writings that we know about. And so it's just kind of interesting that like, the way in which the, the passage itself illustrates how we are always reinterpreting history. Mm-hmm. And we're always going back to our history to find or to set anchors of this is who we are. This is how we know when we're on the right track. And sometimes there needs to be some repentance that goes along with that as well, if not all the time, right? Um, again, different congregations or different preachers will know when it's time to bring that up in their congregation, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. something to note about um, about this scene. Should we move to Ephesians? I'd like well, to. I was... Somebody oh, wants go, to use it ahead. liturgically. Go ahead. Well, I, yes, I, I, I'll just build off of my... My uh, suggestion from last week of how this language here, again, this liturgical language that we find in Ephesians, how might you uh, use that so that it works on people rather than explain it or talk about it? Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, and particularly the uh, the last few verses, uh, and it's it's hard to it's hard to see in well, it, it's okay in the English, but there's just so much. Uh, there, there's so much of of this um, focus on connection and unity, uh, particularly between you know the circumcised and the uncircumcised. But then, 
Verse 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone in him who is the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. I mean, just, you know, if you just take those three verses and look at all of the imagery that it's about this you know, this unification of, you know, foundation and household and growing together and, uh, and you're no longer strangers, obviously, if you're preaching on that, put it into some, you know, the context of the way in which, uh, Ephesians and our commentary points us out about, um, you know, recognizing the, the, speaking of the outpouring of God's love of the Gentiles right now being brought into, um, bring, brought into this household, but it's, it's just beautiful language. <laughs> so I, that, that's one thing I, yeah. So I'll just, I'll, I'll start there by saying, yes, I would find a way in your, if, if you're going that direction, find a way in your service for those words too. Um, and that's why I suggested last week, like, what if you did it liturgically, but then had like a little homilies on, on, you know, just this, how these liturgical words land, uh, mm-hmm. and what do they create? Uh, not just what they say, but what they do. That's the, mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. the point of, of this language here. So I'll start with that. I have a couple other things, but. Well, we'll let you get uh, those other things in there too. I'd like to put on the table um, um, when, when we're looking at this continuation of the monarchy of, of David. Uh, uh, Matt, you uh, clearly were talking about that just a moment ago. Um, so many times when I am uh, reminded of these verses, it pays attention to this idea that um, the law is abolished. Um, and it becomes, we don't have to follow this anymore. Um, but we remember that circumcision was a way of talking about who was in uh, the descendants of Abraham family and who was not. But you've heard me say this before. What we often forget is why was this called out community that were the descendants of Abraham created in the first place or called out in the first place. And it was always for the sake of the other nations. So the law that is abolished is the division of us versus them. And so what, what, this, um, what this reminds us is that when the people of God, Israel, get it right, it's no longer Israel versus everybody else. But it is in Christ Jesus, we are all sharing in this inheritance. We all have our needs met. We all stop being desperate. I'm using all of the language that we use for all the other texts because I'm, I'm trying to hold on to your idea, Caroline, of, of using this, uh, threading this throughout all the weeks. But I don't want to miss the power of what this this particular passage in Ephesians is saying, when the law that is being uh, abolished is the law of division, the law that holds contempt for the other, which seems to be so real for us right now, what, however it is that we modify and label the other, um, what scripture is actually promising is that that division, that law is what is abolished. And we now all belong to one family in Christ Jesus, benefiting from the promises of God. Certainly it's not Torah in general that's abolished. Um, right. That's worth that's worth making sure people <laughs> uh, hear that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, when it comes to Ephesians, I'm increasingly convinced that like the issue that's behind the letter is... is um, a predominantly Gentile Christian community that is tempted to cut loose a Jewish minority yep. mm. within it, which makes it really different from a lot of other letters where like Galatians, for example, where Paul's deeply worried that a, that a Gentile minority is going to get um, 
kind of uh, is, is going to become a stratified community and become oppressed. And so whoever's writing Ephesians here, I think, is talking to Gentiles who are thinking, well, this is great. So I do think some of the hostility is actually Gentile toward Jew. Right, right. As opposed to, like, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to characterize this as somehow Torah observance makes Jews bigoted toward the wider world that some of this is this sense of you know you who are you who are far have now been brought near and it's this idea now that you've got a particular accountability to the people who are here before you so to speak and so um i would urge people to to read this passage in ephesians as a whole in that in that regard to imagine what it's like to be now integrated into a covenantal promise or into a community and think about how that plays itself out and how you live together. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.